from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, everybody. How's everyone doing today? Good. It's been a wonderful, wonderful morning so far. Great crowds out here, beautiful weather, and wonderful guests, and two wonderful authors to introduce to you today. You are in for a real treat. First, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Angie Goff. I am an anchor and reporter here in DC for NBC4, NBC Washington. Just got off the show, made it here in time. Yay, didn't want to miss it. Um, I am also a mother of two, which is why I'm super excited about who is going to be speaking here today. Um, just want to do a couple reminders. If you didn't know, this is the 15th annual Library of Congress Book Festival, National Book Festival, 15 years going strong. And as usual, we are video recording and taking pictures for archival reasons. So just wanted to put that out there. You might see some cameras roaming around. We wanted everyone to be aware of that and in the know. Also something new, I'm not sure if you know about this, but the Library of Congress created their app this year, the National Book app. It is a great resource. This is something that where you can go back, you can learn about the different authors that will be here throughout the day. You'll be able to find out where they are. Um, also learn more about how you can connect with them as well as get maps and other tools that you need to get you through tonight because this thing goes on until 10 p.m. So it's a pretty big deal. Um, and don't forget to use the hashtag NatsBookFest15. We want to interact with you. We know that our guests are very active on social media as well. So that is a great opportunity opportunity to connect. Now to the main event. Her name has been on the New York Times bestseller list, among others, over and over again. Her thrillers, her mysteries, her humor, her heart, through all of her writing, <laughs> and those things too, uh, <laughs> has connected with people all across the world. In 35 countries, in fact, she's been published in several different languages. And if you look at her by the numbers, and we're not given measurements, okay? Um, Lisa Scottolini has written more than 25 books, has more than 30 million copies in print. Here's the boring stuff. She graduated magna cum laude in three years, and yada, 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 from the University of Pennsylvania, and only followed that up with graduating from law school at the same university. But this is what's really cool about her. Lisa loves dogs, big animal lover. She's really fun to follow on Twitter. She's really funny. She has 50 cent on her playlist, and considers, above all, her greatest achievement, not one of her best-selling novels, but the one story that is constantly evolving with a lot of passion, with a lot of laughter, her epic adventure of being a mom, a single mom, to her beautiful, talented daughter, who, by the way, has the best name ever, <laughs> Francesca Saratella. <Yeah. laughs> and so I guess you can guess who our next author is. Francesca Saratella. The smart apple doesn't fall very far from the tree. In fact, she landed at Harvard, where she graduated with top honors and won many awards for her writing. But if you were to meet her in person, maybe on the metro, on the sidewalk, she probably wouldn't tell you any of that. She'd probably whip out her cell phone and show you her camera roll and a ton of pictures of her, the love of her life, her dog, Pip. <laughs> He has his own like Twitter handle too, right? Or, or his own page. He, he, it's just he hijacks mine. Oh, that's what it is. Okay. Uh, she lives in New York and she is currently working on her first novel. Francesca would also probably have no problem bragging and telling you about her really cool mom, who also she claims to be her best friend, who she co-writes a weekly funny column with for the Philadelphia Inquirer. It's called Chick Wit, and it is funny. You know, there's one word that we talk about a lot in television. The C word. And it's not a bad word. It is chemistry. And these two, they've got that. <laughs> the dynamic duo is behind many books, including the one that they are going to chat about today. It makes me crack up every time I say it and hear it. Does this beach make me look fat? <laughs> it's a collection of funny stories and true confessions. It doesn't get more real than this, so get ready to laugh out loud as we welcome Lisa Scottolini and Francesca Saratella to the 2015 National Book Festival. You are so, so cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you so much. 
How cool is she? Oh my God. <laughs> this is so great. This is so wonderful. Thank you so, so much for being here. Uh, I'm Lisa, and the way we're going to do this is I'm going to talk for a while, and then I'm finally going to shut up <laughs> and let my daughter tell the truth about me. Uh, so it's really, yes. uh, and then we'd love to take questions and answers, but I want to start by saying, I'm not sure. You don't need to I'm, the, I have so many microphones now. You got that mic, so you can. So I just speak into my breast. Is that how? Yeah, it's exactly. Right. <laughs> okay, no problem. Did that work? Yeah. Incre oh, this is so much freer. And thank you for signing. I always feel as if it's somewhat redundant when you have an Italian American on the stage. That if we really do our own <laughs> signing, it's just completely incomprehensible to anybody, whether hearing or hearing impaired. But thank you for being here. Why? Because we love books and we love people. This is the place where books and people come together. Um, I will not uh, expound at length about the lofty values of books, but suffice it to say that I have been writing for about 25 years, uh, which is incredible, because I'm only like 32. Um, <laughs> one ankle, basically. Very young but single mother. Very young single mother. But I, um, I always go by this wonderful quote by Francis Ford Coppola. He said, Nothing in my movies ever happened, but all of it is true. Anybody who tries to do anything in the arts, and we'll talk about books because that's what we know about, is trying to write something true. Whether it's emotionally true, like fiction, good fiction, we talked about that a little bit this morning, or literally true. And what happened in my life is about midlife, which was, well, we don't know how long ago that was. It's a dim nightmare. Um, <laughs> but I thought to myself, you know what is miss? I love newspapers. And can we take a second to love your local newspapers? The Washington Post, yes. the Baltimore Sun, read them, support them. They matter, not only for the more serious investigative stuff, but for stuff like this. Because as much as I love my hometown newspaper, I missed, I missed somebody you may remember, Irma Bombeck. I missed that voice because the news is the news and we can't change it. There's war, there's famine, you know, and there's Bradley Cooper, so it's not all bad. <laughs> In fact, it can be very good. But I was reading the newspaper one day going, where, well, first off, there's not a lot of women's voices all the time, right, we know that. And I said, where's the women's voices in the newspaper? But where's the stuff about what really matters to me? Because although I'm very, I'm a political junkie, I care about this one. First priority, always has been. Second priority, the dogs. Third, the cats. Because really. <laughs> Come on, they're the cats. I'm like, could you show me a I'm little love? I'm the defender of the cats. I see. Yeah, Don't worry, cat people. I have them covered. She furbinates the cats. Like... I care. Yeah, thank you. All right, all right, but <laughs> fair point. My point is this. So I actually went to the Inquirer and I said, listen, nobody can bear him a bomb back. And especially what, but can I try? Will you let me write for you? And by the way, these are compiled into books. So when it happened for me was I happened to be at a library fundraiser in Laguna Niguel, California. And let me interrupt myself to say thank you to all of you and thank you to the Library of Congress. Can we have a moment to thank the Library of Congress? Yes. All the amazing things they do for us, all the staff that works its butt off for us, all the volunteers here today, our volunteer who is helping us and got me a Coke that got me already caffeinated enough, <laughs> speaks like three languages. This is because they're librarians and God bless them. So whenever a library asks me to do a fundraiser, I say, yes, I am a library slut. <laughs> so it was a library in Laguna Niguel, California, which is a very nice place. I got my roots done, as I did for you. <laughs> I am at the library fundraiser, and I am divorced twice. It's not the kind of thing that I lead with, because, like, you know, Amy Tan, she's probably not divorced. Like, you know, the cool kids are not, but really, <laughs> I kind of am. So here I am in Laguna Niguel, and I'm kind of like feeling weird about that, and somebody asks me. And then one woman says, I'm divorced five times. And then someone else is like, I'm divorced six times. And I'm like, okay, so I should just move to Laguna Niguel, where clearly <laughs> they're my people. But then what starts happening is that the women start talking, and the one woman who has four divorces has four dogs, and the woman who has five divorces has five dogs. And I'm like, well, I only have two divorces, and I have five dogs, so clearly I'm behind. <laughs> like, 
I'm underachieving in the divorce era. So I got it. But what happened to me that day is I said, you know what? This is interesting because you're feeling like basically I'm going to be real with you. Like, what else is new for me? I felt inferior. <clears throat> Because I said, you know, you love those Irma Bombeck stories, but the, you remember them. You know that she wrote a lot about her husband. Okay, well, I don't have one of those. And she had like a, she had a couple of kids, like Norman Rockwell. Like you have an image of what a family should be. And like Francesca and I like to say, like, this is our Thanksgiving. <laughs> I'm a single mom. It's her. Here we are. We cook Pass for 10, but <laughs> it's just us. Yeah. <laughs> like past the cranberry sauce, right? Um, and so... I said to myself, well, all right, you don't have the life Irma Bomek had, but you, you love your life, and you're not the only one. And um, what I sort of thought to myself was a little bit that every woman, and probably every man, but since I have ovaries, still, I think, um, I, I want to write about my life in a way that is in a representative capacity, because I'm an old Nancy Drew fan. Right? And I love the girl detective, and, I, and that's why my fiction, which I'm not going to bore you with now, I'm not going to bore you with something else now, um, <laughs> is really about the strength and the power and the bravery and the intelligence and the resilience of an ordinary woman, us, dealing with our lives. And I thought, you know, maybe flip it. In other words, the fact that you're divorced twice and you kind of like made some mistakes, and also like, you know, look, you should just stand in for the person who kind of screws up and then tries to get back up. I mean, we're, we're out there. And so, write that. And I thought, well, then the perfect title would be Why My Third Husband Will Be a Dog. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not man bashing, but dog loving. And you know there's a difference. And that's what I started to write about. I said, try to write about the stuff of your family. And believe me, it's not an ego show, because I really do believe it's representative, as all fiction and nonfiction. And when you write that, as I do both, and when you read both, as I'm sure you do, you know that the distinction between those things are, is illusory. Whether it's an emotional truth, like Francis Ford Coppola talked about, or a literal truth, it doesn't matter. The fact is, if you tell it true, it connects. And that is the purpose of books. But you have to tell it true. So that, for example, we started to write these stories, and I wrote about like the time that I found my first gray chin hair and thought I was turning into an Amish man. Right. <laughs> I pluck for you people. Because <laughs> it's the national book. If it were just a state book festival, I wouldn't pluck. Yeah. But for you, roots, plucking, hair, yellow, vanished. <laughs> Women, you understand what I'm talking about. You can talk about the truth of aging. You can talk about the truth of being in the sandwich generation. You can talk about the stuff of your life, even if it isn't storybook. It's the one you got, and how lucky are you to be alive. And if you write about it and you tell it painfully true, Francesca and I always say, if it doesn't make me cringe, it won't make you laugh. You know, it's not some sanitized sitcom true. It's about like the time I saw bunions growing out of my foot, and I, I'm like, I'm a tripod. When did this, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a gargoyle. Like, middle age has enough indignity without you turning into something that should be on a building in cement. So <laughs> this is the kind of stuff I was writing about, and I also started to write about my mother. Because well, if you ask me why I started to write about independent women, it was because of her. How about yours? If you didn't have, right, let's hear it. For mom, yes. And not in a lip service way, but in a real way, because my mother was a force of nature. Let me tell you a story as I try to speak into this thing, which I willed them to put on me and doesn't, is hard. Because I don't listen. Welcome, <laughs> welcome to me. My mother lived in Miami with my brother. She didn't want to live with me. She said, all you do is read and write. It's very boring. I'm like, to you, maybe. She lives down there with him. Uh, one morning, it is a quiet Sunday morning in Miami. My mother wakes up convinced she has felt an earthquake in Miami. She wakes up my brother, Frank, Frank, wake up. There's been an earthquake. He's like, Ma, go to sleep. She goes across the street to the neighbor and wakes him up. This is like 9 o'clock in the Sunday morning. Bruce, Bruce, wake up. There's been an earthquake. He says, Mary, go to sleep. Not my mother. She goes back into the house. And for a reason we will never know, she calls the Miami Herald. So just in case you didn't think newspapers have an important function, 
<laughs> They're there because that was my mother's personal 911, right? She calls them up. She, Hello, Miami Herald. I am here to report that there has been an earthquake. I felt it. They're like, lady, you might be crazy. She's like, tell me your name. Because my mother had the list. Do you recall the name of the list? It's not the things to do list. <laughs> no. Don't say it. All right, well, it's the you know what list. Oh, we're so pure, we can't say shit. <laughs> Did we live through that moment? We lived. Words don't kill us. Ah, oh, thank you. She had the list. She took down his name. He said, may I have your name? Evidently, he had the list too. <laughs> he takes, they trade names, they hang up the phone. Uh, he calls about 10 minutes later. Mary Scottolini, there has been an earthquake. She's like, I know. <laughs> I tried to tell you. You made me feel crazy and old. They sent a news van to the house. <laughs> yeah, it's really true. The TV screen, underneath her cute little face, it says, Earthquake Mary. This she loves. <laughs> my brother goes to the door. Now, my brother is gay and uh, was in one of the more unfortunate wardrobe phases of his life. <laughs> I'm speaking about the mesh t-shirt tank top phase. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's how we roll, baby. <laughs> and do you know why he wears the mesh tank? so that you can better see the map of Italy tattooed on his chest. Yes! Do you think I'm right. making this up? And don't forget to say how remarkable it is. I mean, why they were filming her. Yeah, I will. Okay. But first I have to tell him that Milan was his left nipple. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. They're filming her. They say to her, you were the only person. In fact, if you Google this now, but don't, because I wrote about it, and you can Google it later and see that I'm telling you the truth. She was the only person in South Florida who felt an earthquake that occurred where? Tampa. <laughs> <laughs> the earthquake occurred, it was, how far is Tampa? I don't even know, I still don't care, but it's far. Really <laughs> far. She felt it. She, and that's how the, the headline, the first lead of the newspaper <laughs> article says, it was a quiet Sunday morning. The only person who felt an earthquake that occurred in Tampa, and the only person who was my mother, when they bring <laughs> the microphone to her on the lawn, they say to her, how is it you're the only one? She said, because I know these things. <laughs> that was my mother. <laughs> Isn't there just a little bit of your mother in there? My mother, when she, I, there was going to be a uh, hurricane. And so I made her fly up to Philadelphia. Because I was, she's 4'11". Like, you could blow away. <laughs> so I will make her go on the plane, but she gets off the plane, she's mad. I always think of Yosemite Sam when I think of my mother. Because <laughs> yeah. there was just a little bit of like, right. boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and um, she's mad. She gets off the plane. Of course, some poor newscaster makes the mistake of approaching her with a microphone. You're getting the pattern here. Big mistake. Me also. Don't give me anything that makes me talk louder. It's a problem. <laughs> he says to her, did you come up here because you were afraid of the hurricane? She said, I'm not afraid of a hurricane. I am a hurricane. <laughs> now, what I'm saying to you is that she was a force of nature. Yes. And aren't we all? Maybe we're a little quieter. Maybe we're a little less profane. Um, Maybe we don't have the swag that my mother had, but we are. We're that, we are what knits that family. You know, we know when your soccer practice is and your violin thing is, and we, we have a running schedule in the back of our mind all the time as mothers, don't we? Even still, this beautiful kid of mine is 30 years old. I'm 29. Tw <laughs> Every time she says, you know, she's, you never get my birthday right. You know, I don't like, think they think that matters. Most I know, people. But here's the thing. And everybody who is on a something nine birthday will understand. It's so close that I seem like I'm neurotic about it if I correct her. But at the same time, I'm not 30 yet. So just cool it with the she's Fair 30. Fair point. Not Fair like point. Okay. You. I'm I watching. feel you. I'm over here. That's what the K. I got I a mic you. too. <laughs> Anyway. I'm sorry, I'm 29. And she's 29 year old daughter, right. And I forgot what I was going to say. What about being 29? And even you're still knowing. Yes, what? still knowing. Thank you, see? Yeah. And she's probably <laughs> knowing too. And I think that's part of what I write about in these books because we're in the sandwich generation. 
I got a strong mother on one hand, and I got a strong daughter on the other. A strong 29-year-old daughter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> barely, barely. <laughs> and God bless her for that. God bless her that she, you know, she's got moxie. So here's a quick story, and then we'll turn it over. Uh, so one day, of course, worlds will collide because you, you, you're in the middle. You're like, whatever you are, you're the tuna fish, and there's the, the raw. One day, my daughter is home visiting, and my mother's home visiting. And uh, Francesca is at the kitchen island reading a magazine. And the magazine says, oh, mom, she says to me, you know, it says here that you should change your razor. Oh, yeah, we're going there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you should change your razor every three to five uses. How often do you throw away your razor? I go, well, I throw away my razor when rust appears in my armpit. Right. Like if there's like an orange streak, it might be time to toss that sucker and out. I knew that was the answer. It was a subtle hint to you. Yes, that it was there a were, subtle hint. Different hygiene like, guidelines. Like we really care, right? Like who cares? Okay, it's I'll do it when I damn well please. How about that? So then my mother comes down because I'm like, oh, this is a very interesting situation. So I say to my mother, uh, Ma, you know Francesca, it says here in the magazine. You throw your razor away every three to five uses. How often do you throw your razor away? And she says, I don't have any hairs. And I go, okay. <laughs> so if you have learned nothing else today, <laughs> but that, that is it, <laughs> right, the more you know. <laughs> but that's you, I say to her, well, mom, um, it says here that uh, in this magazine, you're supposed to throw your razor away every three to five uses. She says, well, I don't, I don't, I don't know the point of that. And then all of a sudden she switches gears. Because in my family also, do you remember those, um, I always think those toys that were plastic beads and the kids would pull them, right? And you could stick them together. And so one was blue and one was red and one was yellow. That's how all the conversations are with my mother in my family, right? There's not necessarily red leading to red. It's like, oh, we're on blue. You see what I'm saying? So where we're talking about razors, but all of a sudden she says, oh, I'm mad about something. I go, what are you mad about? I'm mad because my colander broke, she says. My colander broke. Oh, this makes me so mad. You remember the colander, Lisa. The stars, the dots are in the shape of stars, and the foot fell off. Do you believe that? I go, Ma. Well, I actually do remember that colander, and if I remember that colander, at the time the story took place, I would say that was a 58-year-old colander. <laughs> And she says, I know, but I paid good money for it. <laughs> now, what I am saying to you is in the normal world, the unexamined life really is not worth living <laughs> or writing about. We examine our lives, because I'm in this moment going, this is not about plastic razors and colanders. Lisa, pay attention to your own life. This is about being between these two great women who are of differing generations. This one taught, no fault of hers, they're taught to throw it away. Throw it away. And my mother, who thinks nothing should be thrown away and nothing should break, more importantly, because she did not. Right? That generation went through hell and back, and they didn't break. And I think that that's what is in the spirit of these books, before I turn it over to you. That it is really, there, there's a series of them. They started with Third Husband. The most recent is, this speech, does this speech make me look fat? Francesca thought of the title. <laughs> the answer is, it doesn't matter whether, don't worry about whether you look fat or not. It's really a way to live life, to celebrate those smaller moments that you have with each other. I must say, while you have each other. We lost my mother. Not really, though. This book, Beach, is really a lot about her, about, about hospice with her which was amazingly <coughs> as sad as it was, was funny and happy too. And those of you who have lost people and who have kept people, who have been through that journey with people you love, you've lived it. You will know it. We will always be there writing about it, and we appreciate so much your being here for us. So thank you. Good. Well, yeah, so... I am her 29-year-old daughter, and um, yeah, we, you know, we, we're so happy to be here. This is such an honor, and i um, so excited. I'm going to zip through some of our thanks, because tell a story, but 29 is a funny age. 
Because I'm at the age now where the, the, for the summer vacations, the, the charm of sunbathing on the fire escape has officially worn off. But I'm not really at the stage where I have like a lovely summer home to go to. I don't have any Hamptons to share. So basically, that means this summer, if you invited me somewhere, I am coming. I'm saying yes. I'm going to be there on Thursday night. I'm going to leave on Sunday afternoon. I'll do the dishes. I'll do the sheets. I'll make the whole place. I'll be your maid. But I want to do it. My mom's not exactly in the same phase of her life. So this, we, get, we got invited to the, the Nantucket Book Festival. And she's like, I'm so excited, Nantucket. I've never been there before. The publisher's going to fly us out. I'm so thrilled. She's like, oh, Nantucket. Oh, that's so far. Oh, what a haul. Like, she's over it. She's been there, done there, even with this. You know, it's she's about so the relaxed. time, though. Don't diss Nantucket on tape, anyway. Please, no, it's not right. But, well, she says it's about the time. That's it her cover. It is about the time. Oh, really? Because why didn't we take the flights? That's it. You tell us right. why. Right, because interrupt. the publisher offered to fly us there, which is the shortest and quickest way to get into Nantucket. But my mom said, oh, yeah, they offered us the planes, but I told them we'd rather drive. I said, we, we would? We would rather, would, okay, we would rather drive. And even though we're speaking there Saturday morning, she wants to drive up Friday night and leave Saturday at noon as soon as we're done. I'm like, oh, no, but like, oh, my God. Okay, so we go up. I'm trying to be cooperative. They put us in this charming little bed and breakfast, like everything's crisp white sheets, the soaps and little shapes of sailboats and seashells. I'm like, oh, you're all coming with me, little cuties. I'm taking, I'm like not going to CVS this month. I'm so excited, like I'm loving it, I'm living it. I'm just, I love the festival, I love this festival to get to, I'm as much of a fangirl to authors as anybody here, so it was the same way there. And I think I got you to stay for like a lobster roll in the afternoon. <laughs> I inched you toward, but I couldn't get you to stay over Saturday night. Much like tonight, we're not staying over in D.C. tonight. It's not like there's anything to see in this city, right? It's not, like a, it's not a tourist destination. Um, but so, so we are leaving, and, and this is when, you know, we still have this mother-daughter moments. People sometimes think our relationship must be perfect if we write together and we work together, and she is my best friend. But we also have our little chihuahua fights, as we call them, because they're just, they're just little, but they're, they're serious. And they do happen in the car. You know, earlier this morning, she was telling a story about an incredible bonding moment in the car. But it's, I don't know if this is true of your kids in the car. It's one of two things. It's either a soul-searching, connected discussion, or it's a cage match. That's the only two choices. <laughs> like, it's a confined space. It's going one way or the other. This is what's happening. So we're driving home from Nantucket, driving home because it's faster. And we're on I-95, and just as the sun is setting in Rhode Island, I feel her start to ride the brake until she's literally going between 40 and 45 miles an hour on I-95. Truckers are going by like, like riding our tails. Little old ladies are driving by like, get your eyes checked. I mean, she's crazy. I'm, I keep looking over, I'm like, uh, Mom, you okay? She goes, I'm fine. It's like, um because the speed limit is, is 65 here. And she's like, I'm driving as fast as I can. It's not going to make any difference whether I drive at 65 miles an hour or 45 miles an hour. It's a long drive. Now listen, I mean, you raised me an educated person. Like, rate times time equals distance. <laughs> like, that's, that's just true. So I admit, not my finest moment. I, I did pull yeah. up my calculator. Yeah. Just to, no, you know. let me just say that, for real. Yeah, she I says rate times time equals this, and I'm like, first of all, who raised you? I blinded you with science, she and I, I calculated, because she's going to get us home at like she's 3 in the morning. Me, actually, instead of, if you go at 65 miles an hour, is it? for 370 miles, boop, 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 boop. Oh my, um, oh, my God. It's like a nightmare. I just wanted her to make an informed decision about how slowly she was driving. <laughs> but, so then she was like, no, you know what? You're right. We are going to get home too late. We'll just stay over at the Ramada Inn in Connecticut. I was like, we left the sailboats. I mean, we left the little soaps. I mean, I took them with me, but we essentially left their home, their ancestral homeland, and now we're staying at Ramada? And then I was like, oh, no. Then we're not staying there. We're going all the way home to New York. And I, th at that point, like, then now we're, like, actually having a real fight. Like, now we're an actual hat traffic. On 95. Traffic. Right. At speed. So we pull over in some, like, weird truck stop for, like, truckers and truckers only. <laughs> like, there was just a lot of beef jerky. There was just a lot of smoked, I don't know, MSG around. And we're now we're, like, fighting in the fluorescent lights. And, but in that moment, I see that you look tired. Yeah. And I realized that, you know, to a certain extent when you work with your mother, I regress too. 
So I'm like acting like a little kid, like, why aren't you doing this? I'm not, I'm not really helping her. So I say, Mom, why don't you let me drive? She looks at me like, oh, what? <laughs> now to a certain extent, although she does underestimate me and still calls me her kid and still thinks of me like that, I get it because I went to a city school. I lived, I've lived in New York for the last five years. The last time I parallel parked was my driver's test. I nailed it, but it was a while ago. <laughs> I was like, how hard can it be, right? I'm mean, like driving, like, oh, I'm, it's like riding a bike. But um, so she's like, are, are you sure? And then basically trying to call my bluff, but then I, I had to go with it. And you probably didn't think I was actually gonna do it because she's already like missed theatrics when I'm just even pulling out of the parking lot. She's like, oh, 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 oh. It's like the US Open, right? Oh, oh. The whole time I'm like, is this helpful? Is this your supportive? But yeah, I mean, you let me do it. I think you tried to distract me by asking about all my ex-boyfriends. And I tried to distract her by telling her about them. <laughs> so you never know, right? Un unknown unknowns came out. But, um, but we made it, and I, got, I even got through the exit jumping into Manhattan. I was, um, it was like sort of, I was at this moment where I had really come a long way because there was a Bentley pulled over that flashed me. It was like near the exits entering Manhattan. It's because I live in New York. And flashed me and flagged me down. And so we like, I slow up. I go, so she goes, this Russian woman from the back seat rolls the window down and goes, excuse me, do you know the way to Manhattan? And I was like, sure, follow me. Like I've done it all the time. Now meanwhile, what's going on with the GPS in a Bentley, right? Like send that right back. If you have to ask me, if you're just like, hey, random inexperienced driver. So that was sad. But when I got you to admit, I got home, we got out, you know, you had to get your land legs a little bit from utter terror. She said, she, she's since told me that she had her eyes closed for most of the construction part of I-95. Great, very right. well, thanks for fairness, the Well, but in fairness, you didn't tell him. I mean, because the real reason, in my own defense, I must say. Oh, well, you're Have you had the experience? What happened is, I realize I'm one of these people now that I can't drive at night. Like, when we're in the fight yeah. in the well, truck stop. In, the, in this rest yeah. stop, she goes, it would be great if you could drive, because I feel like I can't see. Which at that point, like... <laughs> That was something you should have told me. And I was like, well, mom, I'm like, if you can't see, then I definitely need to drive. And she Wait. goes, well, no, when I drive, when it's slower, I can see. I'm like, that yes. doesn't make yes. any sense. I don't even understand that. That doesn't just, make any sense. Because I said it's like in the dark. Like, nobody in a dark room runs into a dark room. Like, you walk No, none of this. No, none room. of it. That's because so you're just, feeling I'm like, around. Like, what? Sit what down. am I doing wrong? Sit down, you're crazy. Like, you don't wrong. see. You need me to drive. And I hope that when I got you home safely and you, you like fell into my arms and collapsed into me, that you realize that I am a competent human being who you gets are. places on time without <laughs> you even telling me to do so. So, I'm tr you know, it's a work in progress. Um, I'm tempted to tell another story, but I know we might not have time for questions. So. No, well, whatever you think. You, you, got you want a story? This is one more story. Thank you. <laughs> so I do know that there's one. I, know, I mean, now, so, so she does say, she, you know, like all mothers, she has my schedule and everywhere that I am in her head at all times. And I know she worries a lot, and I try not to give her reason to worry, but occasionally stories happen to me that I know are not like the stories your mom wants to hear about your life in New York. And um, one of them is, was, was this. Uh, I'll, I'll start telling my stepsister was visiting me for her birthday in the, one summer. And um, so we both had little dogs. We, we had, had this great night. I wanted her to see, you know, all this amazing things that New York has to offer, the great restaurants, landmarks, all the sites. I didn't expect this sight, but when we were walking the dogs at the end of the night, uh, we're walking and a gentleman, I, I, would, I would use the word generously, but a gentleman stepped out from between two cars and he was not dressed for the weather. <laughs> no. No, he wasn't. And I went from zero to Philly in four seconds flat. I was like, ew, I see you. That's disgusting, you perverts. Get out of here. Get out before I mace you. And he zipped up and he zipped on out of there. Right, my, my stepsister's about six foot tall, big blue eyes. She looks like a lighthouse. She was like, oh my God, was that his? And I was like, yes. And she goes, is he? And I said, like, how did you react so fast? And I said, I know him. <laughs> oh, no, I mean, I do. Uh, you know, he's my regular flasher. It's my, you know, he's not just, And um, it was sort of this one summer where this guy kept doing that. And, you know, he shouldn't even flatter himself because I wanted to say to the guy, like, you're not even my first flasher, okay? <laughs> like, I'm not that interested in you. My first flasher was, um, I was, well, actually, my mom was visiting me. And of course, when she visits me, she has to bring all her dogs in tow. So she had like a little puppy that she brought with her, which was pretty fun, but the dog's not house trained. And at three in the morning, um, she 
the dog has to go out. And she goes, just put her on the floor and let her go. <laughs> like, because it's my apartment, right? And we're sharing a bed, if that wasn't clear in this story. Clean like, it I, up I don't, the next morning. I'm not a high roller in New York, so we're sharing a bed, and you just tell me, let your dog pee in my apartment. So I'm like, oh, no, I'm going to take her out. So I walk her. And I walk her by this restaurant that's like super she she. It's so exclusive, they don't have a listed number. If you want to go and eat there, I'm not, as, not a celebrity, you sort of go, go and grovel and be like, please, can I please have your overpriced mac and cheese? Like, it's so obnoxious. But so I'm walking by then. I remember I saw a kitchen worker I could see from his uniform that, and I chose to go that way because I was like, oh, there's a man at work. That's someone I can trust. So I walk by, and as I pass him, I hear some noise, and I look back. The apron is a loincloth. He's doing the hand drive. I was like, ugh. And when that happened, I didn't, I didn't, wasn't so seasoned then. So I didn't have my instant, you know, anger to spew at him. I come back to my, my mom, and I didn't wake her up because I was like nice, but I'm lying there in bed like, oh my God, I was walking to her dog. I was like so mad, right? When she wakes up, I guilt her full force. <laughs> I'm like, do you know what happened to me while I was walking your dog? <laughs> and I tell her, and I'm like, and this is disgusting, and she's like, that's outrageous. And I was, she's like, oh, you should tell the manager. And I was like, yeah, I should, you're right. She goes, yeah, we could get a free meal. <laughs> Like, are we not hard up for the restaurant? I was like, yeah, no, okay, like, we're not doing that. I did go to the manager and tell him, and he was justly horrified. I mean, I knew he was just thinking, like, what if this happened to someone who mattered? <laughs> oh, my God, like, B and Jay-Z could have done. But it wasn't. Um, but so, yeah, I, so I'm a, I'm a pro with the flashers. And this, this one guy who was the repeat offender, I mean, it was great, because I would, like, I knew his routine. We practically, it was, it was our routine, really. But... <laughs> You walk around on a loop. So one night, like, he flashed me, I yelled at him, he ran away. And then when I come around the, the block, I see him then on the other side of the street, but he doesn't see me this time. So I'm like, hey, buddy, I see you. I recognize you, flasher, pervert. I'm going to call the police. And meanwhile, like, I'm pretty sure it was him. Like, I, I mean, like, it was harder with his pants up, but, like, I'm, like, 90% sure that I yelled at the right person. Um, yeah, I mean... <laughs> It's a whole thing. And then there was finally, at the end of the summer, I, I saw the guy one more time, and I was just, like, exhausted. I couldn't even get my usual fire and brimstone. I was just like, please just stop. I don't want to see this. It's really gross. Like, I don't need this anymore. And he actually goes, sorry. <laughs> I was like, thank you. I felt so listened to. <laughs> so, you know... Um, that, those are the kind of stories that don't make you happy. But no, they make I'm me sorry. sad. But, you know, you raised a tough girl, and that's what... We, we think there are so many strong women in this audience, in this world, and that's what we're trying to write about and have fun with. Right. But. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you, have any, do you have any questions, or if not, we can tell... Yes, please. Are you still doing the book club party? I'll answer. Uh, the, so the question is, are you still doing your house parties? The answer is yes. Um, I love book clubs. I love anybody who reads us. I, I mean, really, we do. We're very, very grateful. And book clubs who read um, our books get to come to our house. <laughs> Simple as that. You can see on my website, we have it the first weekend of October. We've done it for 10 years. It was actually featured in Time Magazine. It's the largest book club party ever. It has grown from like 30 people that we all cooked for and I made cookies to now on, both on Saturday and on Sunday, 500 people on both days. Right, it's fine. So we have tents, we have music, we have catering. It's a whole, it's a book of palooza. So we, it, check out the website, you'll see. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. I feel like I want you to tell them that taxi story. I think we have like a minute. <gasps> no. I know. Yeah, it's yeah, such that's a funny <laughs> story. Okay, forget it. <laughs> Any other questions then? I probably talked too long. Of course. Of course. Can we, we're on leashes. <laughs> I'm gonna suck it in. Yeah. Do the arm thing, right? Like, I'm embarrassed to do this arm thing now. Because oh, we all know what the dumb. arm is about, right? I was just trying to get the Michelle Obama arms. See, I bet get they active. don't know what that's about. Do you know what she's even talking about? Yeah, they do. Does right. everybody know that but me? I didn't I even know, know that. Right? Like, right, you do this and then you look extra thin. Well, I guess we should say some closing arms. things rather than about. Yeah, no, it's absolutely. <laughs> nice, huh? I quoted this before, but I will tell you that the great quote by Oscar de la Renta. It's not a great No woman quote. over 50 should wave goodbye. I don't support that goodbye. quote. <laughs> Thanks for coming to the National Book Festival. We appreciate it. Yeah, that's right. I'm a woman and I'm old. <laughs> Thanks.
thank you very, thank you very so much. much. We appreciate you meeting <laughs> us. We appreciate you taking care of the book festival. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.